Hello, Made to Thrive Nation. I've got a holistic psychiatrist on the show today, one of my favorite people out there. She's a health giant, a health hero, a very humble woman that I've just got so much time for. She's written an incredible book called The Anatomy of Anxiety, an author, a board-certified psychiatrist, a board-certified acupuncturist, a yoga teacher, someone who is, I think everybody should be listening to. Welcome to the Made to Thrive show, Dr. Ellen Vora. Oh, Steve, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. What a privilege to have you on. And I'd like to get the, the viewers on YouTube and uh, the listeners on the podcast to really grab hold of a story that they can relate to, a narrative that people might be really struggling with. In South Africa and Africa, anxiety and stress is a really big problem. Bloomberg in 2015 voted South Africa as the second most stressful country to live in the world. Uh, anxiety is really a problem and stress is a problem from a number of reasons in terms of crime, safety, some basic needs that aren't in place. So give us some stories that people can sort of grab hold on to. Sure. So a few stories that come immediately to mind. One patient of mine, for the purposes of anonymity, I'll call her Allison. And she actually really represents so much of what I find fulfilling in the work that I do. She first came to me a long time ago. It was probably 2012, um, so just over 10 years ago. And she, at the time, was really struggling in her life. Her predominant symptom that was bothering her and creating suffering was anxiety and panic attacks. But she also struggled with depression. She also struggled with sleep. She struggled with ADHD. Um, she had very low self-esteem in terms of her ability to academically perform. At the time, she was working and in night school. And uh, she also uh, had polycystic ovary syndrome. She wasn't getting her period regularly. She was being put on many different birth controls and she was getting symptomatic from those. So we had a lot of work to do. And um, it was a beautiful journey with her, partly in that nobody in the many, many doctors that she'd seen, she'd seen many primary care doctors, OBGYNs, psychiatrists, therapists, really nobody was asking her about her diet or her lifestyle. So they were asking her about her family history. They were asking about her psychiatric history and her medication history. And they were really going off of exclusively that information and saying, well, you've taken Prozac in the past or fluoxetine. So, you know, you tolerated it well, let's put you back on that one. And you didn't tolerate Vyvanse. So let's switch you to Adderall. And mm. she was always kind of being pinballed around and nobody was getting to the root of anything of what was going on for her. For me, it was obvious, especially with that combination of physical ailments and psychiatric ailments. To me, this, this suggested that there was a physical basis for a lot of the ways that she had so-called mental illness. And so um, I asked about her diet and her digestion, her energy, her sleep, and then more psycho-spiritual inventions of her life. Did she have mm. community? Did she feel a sense of meaning and purpose? And of course, you know, every single dimension of that was off track and out of mm. alignment. And just slowly over, the, over time, we nudged some things back into place. In her case, she actually had undiagnosed celiac disease. That's not every patient of mine. A lot of my patients seem to have some degree of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but in her case, it was full-blown celiac. So getting her off of gluten was a biggie. It's wild to me that no one else looking at this patient with a malar rash and polycystic ovary syndrome and digestive issues and so much physical discomfort that nobody thought to look at celiac, but um, that was at play. And she also had dairy intolerance, which can often go hand in hand, whether that has to do with the long-term damage to the gut from undiagnosed celiac, but she couldn't tolerate dairy. And then the medications themselves were affecting her. And one problem I identified for her was that she was in a lot of interdose withdrawal. So she was taking a benzodiazepine at the time it was Ativan to help with her anxiety. And she would take it, she would feel better. And then several hours later, her body would be in a state of relative withdrawal and she would panic. And she was on that roller coaster day in, sure. day out. So we worked to first switch her to a longer acting benzodiazepine, which is clonopin. And then slowly over time, we tapered her off of that completely. So she's not on that 
pharmacologic roller coaster at all. And for her, addressing all of these issues at the root has meant at this point, she no longer struggles with anxiety. She does not have ADHD. She ended up getting off of all stimulants. Um, we did have to fix her mouth breathing at night so she could sleep more deeply and that helped her with focus and also not being so inflamed and being better nourished helped her with focus. She ended up graduating from her night school without any stimulants, which she didn't even know was possible for her. So it changed yeah. her sense of identity and her sense of herself as more capable. And then, um, and at this point she's ended up moving. She has since gotten married. She's since gotten pregnant. Yeah. And um, no more polycystic ovary syndrome. She gets her period like clockwork. And, um, but what was most interesting about her case for me was not even repairing her mental and physical ailments at the root, but it was helping her connect to what in our treatment we've been calling her true yes and her true no. And this relates to the work of Marshall Rosenberg, where when she navigates the decisions of her life, she checks in with her body. She takes a sacred pause. She checks in and she says, you know, does my body say yes or say mm. no? And that check-in has been the golden compass in her life. And it's yeah. been in certain ways, the most remarkable takeaway from this treatment is that now she has a really strong connection to her intuition, to her sense of her own needs, to her sense that she's worthy of having her needs met. And she navigates from that place of empowerment and self-love. So it's wow. been a really life affirming. Work what a great together. story. And I just want to ask a few questions. I think this is very common and I think uh, it brings you such satisfaction. I can see in such meaning to do this work, mm -hmm. but do these psychiatric patients with anxiety or depression have the insight to change their lives? Do they have the ability to have self-discipline and self-control or do you work with a health coach or a family member? Because, you know, been in practice 24 years, been doing functional medicine for many years, you get a patient with maybe an autoimmune rheumatoid arthritis, but right. they seem to be, okay, stop them with the lectins or take them onto an anti-inflammatory diet. They seem to have the insight, the ability, call it the cognitive ability to do it. But now you're dealing with a psychiatric patient or a patient with mental ill health. How do they follow through with your protocol? That's a great question. Everyone is different. I often am using Gretchen Rubin's types. She has this rubric for understanding, are some people upholders? Are they obligers? Are they questioners? Are they rebels? And I really work with that framing. And some of my patients are just inherently upholders. And I can tell them, do these steps and you'll mm. feel better. And they're like, tell me how to jump and I'll say how high. Mm. And so with those folks, I actually have to be careful and rein in my recommendations a bit so that they don't kind of go into a, more of an orthorexic state. Um, so I keep them in more of a balanced, looser grip, but I give them instructions and they follow through. With a lot of my patients, they need some degree of accountability. And I love working with health coaches. I love that accountability and that support and handholding, but also that knowledge base because we're living in the wake of so many decades of misleading nutrition research and the headlines and our media messaging. And so a lot of people are just confused and they're thinking, is cholesterol bad? Should I be eating egg white omelets? Should I eat skinless chicken breast? Should I eat low fat dairy? Should mm. I eat vegetable oils? Is that the healthy choice? Yeah. And so I just want them to have someone to bounce all these ideas off of because we can't, we can't rely on the consensus nutritional narrative that we've all been indoctrinated with for decades, it's wrong and misleading and leaves us mm. healthy and with struggling with diabetes. And so mm. I like them to have a health coach to just re-educate. Um, but some of my patients these days, even just with like wearables, like an aura ring, which I have mixed feelings mm. about, but for some folks, that's been the proper amount of accountability. It's like, if I can make changes to get a better sleep score, um, not only is their sleep improved, which mm. everything else improves at, as a result, but also then they're doing less screen time in the evening. They're cutting back on alcohol. They're starting to do intermittent fasting. And yeah. you just see people get other benefits, even from the accountability of a wearable device. Sure. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. So second story, hopefully a male that you can think of that people can relate to. Yeah. And I just, there was another piece of your question, your, your original question about when someone's struggling with mental health that I want to address, which is that this is a delicate balance because sometimes when somebody is depressed, 
getting out of bed, taking a shower is hard enough, let alone rehabilitating our diet, prioritizing all of these functional medicine interventions. And so I'm very much working in that gray area with people. I spend a lot of time making sure that we figure out what's the low hanging fruit and the quick wins up front where they put a little minimal bit of effort in, find that they get some benefit and not only witness themselves being effective, making a real shift, which starts to be, uh, it gives them hope and it's motivating, mm. but it also gives them a little bit more of a foundation of, of well being to stand off of to make the next incremental change. So I do think about that quite a bit. And I love mm. the work of Chris Palmer, who has a book out right now called Brain Energy. And I'm usually thinking about when someone's so depressed and anhedonic and unmotivated that they can't even make these changes. Yeah. I'm always thinking about their mitochondrial and their metabolic health. Yeah. Why do they not have energy? And so are there ways that I can subtly support that in order to make all these other changes possible? And that's powerful. I just want to make a comment before we go into the next story is that you know, changing your nutrition or putting a diet in place or even working with a health coach is a low-hanging fruit. But I, I say to patients, it's the hardest fruit to pull off the tree. So what is mm. simple is not necessarily easy. And I was speaking to my spiritual mentor today, and uh, we were just looking through what food in sort of a biblical or religious sense has meant and even the story of eve of a fruit that was tempting there's you know your second brain being your gut what do you think about changing sort of circadian rhythm or framework before you start changing someone's diet because it is so dopaminergic that that eating it's so it's so difficult to sustain maybe easy in the beginning but to constantly you know pull that lever of food i don't think is a is an easy one at all simple but easy no yeah. Oh, I love that you brought that up, Steve. And I, I, I glean from your podcast, you've been practicing functional medicine for maybe like 25 years. Uh, 24 years. Seem, it's hard to reconcile with how youthful you look, but if you say so, <laughs> um, but I've been doing it, you know, a little over 10 years. And yeah. I think it's only been in the last few years that I've really come to appreciate for many of my patients, it doesn't make sense to start with food. And I used to always want to start with food. Um, and now it's different for everybody, yeah. but sometimes it's just, I listen for like, where do they seem like, oh, okay, I could try that. And where are they like, mm. no way. And yeah. for some people it's an earlier bedtime um, and, and just a little bit of morning sunshine. Sometimes that's the lowest hanging fruit. And that's not asking a lot. It's not an overhaul. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice. It's just something that almost feels good to someone who's already feeling really unmotivated. And so just getting sleep on track is really foundational to all of these other changes, but everyone's a little different. Some people it's like, no way. What I'm most attached to is staying up till two in the morning coding, but I am willing to take a walk after dinner. Yeah. And so everyone's just a little different in that regard, but I think you're right. Food, we hold it really dear. It yeah. has nostalgia. It has convenience, affordability, religious considerations, ethical considerations. There's so much to that it's such a fraught topic that it's sometimes the hardest place to start yeah. talking about food and uh, i want to go into the second uh, story but eating with people and i know there's a lot of research from a sort of socio healthy perspective or families that eat together stay together but is there a change in sort of the neurobiology of when people come together and they eat food together does that change the informational uh, sort of substance of food and how that has an effect on the body or the mind versus someone who's eating alone that's really interesting if there is data on this i'm probably a little low on on being aware of it but what i do know on a purely material physical basis any amount of slowing down and sort of registering i am about to eat um, helps start the cephalic phase of digestion. And in many ways, what we're ailed with in modern life is poor digestion because we're rushed, because we're barely chewing, uh, because we already have a compromised digestive tract. Eastern medical philosophies have always been more hip to this concept of how do you promote better digestive fire? How do you promote good digestion? Because that's how you assimilate the most useful properties of the food you eat. And 
we've really overlooked that in modern Western medicine. And so I think that just slowing down and sitting down and even your brain just being like, I'm about to eat a meal rather than just like you pull it out of the microwave, you go straight back to your desk. And as mm -hmm. you're answering emails, you're like, are blindly just mm -hmm. mindlessly inhaling food. Even just being like, I'm sitting down helps us Eat, start the cephalic phase, we start to digest our food, even in our mouth, we start to secrete digestive juices into our stomach and small intestine. And we're a little bit more likely to chew thoroughly and take slower bites and just be a little bit more present with the process. But I think on a psycho-spiritual level, we are so disconnected. We're missing each other's bids. We are hyper-connected on the internet, but isolated in our physical lives and any meal with people that we love grounds us in community, which I think mm. on a hardwired level is part of how we feel safe. I think it's a treatment for anxiety because on that proverbial savanna of evolution, we weren't the strongest or the fastest mm. species. We were the ones that most effectively cooperated. I think it's for this reason that when we feel a sense of belonging and connection, we feel safe. And when we mm. feel disconnected, isolated, ostracized on some level to our DNA, it feels like it's a matter of life or death. So sharing a meal with friends, even if you're eating all the wrong foods and it's at a circadianly <laughs> inappropriate time to eat, I think it's still net healthy and therapeutic because we just need to ground with community. I think it's the priority above everything else. Fantastic. Well said and community is such an important pillar. Let's talk about the second story of a male that you've seen that you've changed their life dramatically through holistic psychiatry? This would be more of a straightforward example, but I'm thinking of a particular patient where there were two main things that were impactful. And one was that he had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, which is probably something that's come up on your podcast. It certainly has come up in your practice. And for years and years, he had been taking an, an acids because um, he had heartburn. And he felt like, oh, this is uncomfortable. And his doctor said, oh, we have a treatment for that. Here, take these antacids. And he was doing that chronically. And for me, it just encapsulates the difference between conventional medicine, which is reactive and focused on symptom suppression um, in contrast to functional medicine, which is root cause resolution. And in the case of the antacids for his heartburn, they were suppressing his symptoms, but in so doing, they were actually exacerbating the underlying cause of his heartburn, which was the SIBO. So mm. in functional medicine, we see heartburn and we don't just think, oh, well, the body is broken. It made a mm. mistake. Let's yeah. suppress the stomach acid. We think, why? Why is this happening? And so, you know, I saw that heartburn and I thought, why do you have increased abdominal pressure? You're not pregnant. He's not obese. What was pushing acid up from the stomach into the esophagus? Mm. And in his case, it was a really out of control state of SIBO. So we treated the SIBO and not only did his digestion improve and his assimilation of nutrients improve and he was less inflamed and his mental health improved just by virtue of changing that dysbiosis, but also the heartburn went away and he just sure. did not need the antacids anymore. And to me, the deepest irony of the conventional approach is that those antacids were probably exacerbating the SIBO yeah. because that initial barrier with stomach acid to killing off some of the bacteria we ingest, he was losing that barrier. And so it was just pouring gas on the flames and he was yeah. getting a more and more um, developing, progressive developing case of SIBO. Um, sure. For him in the long term, and this is an important distinction between with my female patients, with male patients, I do find things like intermittent fasting, and ketogenic diets can be really beneficial for mental health conditions. I think they're more complicated with females of reproductive age, but for males, it's a really nice intervention. And for him, that was the final strategy that really took him over the finish line in terms of just feeling well in his life, no longer needing psychiatric medication, no longer suffering with symptoms. Sure. Well done. Well done. Do you know an athlete? You know, I get a lot of athletes who listen to the show. I deal a lot of them at the practice and then all the executive coaching and corporate wellness we do. So athletes come in also with maybe performance anxiety or they come out with burnout or just constantly tired and fatigued. Tell us possibly a bit of your framework or story. Yeah. I mean, 
it's not a focus in my practice. So a lot of what I know mm. about how to support athletes is just coming from when I listen to what I affectionately refer to as bro wellness podcasts, <laughs> sort mm. of like making sure people are taking rest days and mm. actually getting enough nourishment and all of that. But in my practice, I have one particular athlete that stands out. So this will be a little bit more of a, a funky story, but yeah. in his case, um, he's an athlete and he was, he had a really successful athletic career when he was younger. And then he started having just accumulation of a lot of injuries and it became really painful for him to continue to do sports in adulthood. And he was not only missing this way of a sense of his identity, how he would exercise, keep himself healthy, but it was really a lifeline for him in terms of his mental health as well. And he lost access to that because of his injuries and his pain. And his process was, you know, for years, I was like, oh, we need to get you into functional manual therapy. You need to see the right osteopath. You need to see the right physical therapist. We need to address inflammation. He had a little bit of psoriasis. So I was like, you're inflamed. That's why your joints mm. hurt. I was going down all these pathways and I stand by these pathways. I think sure. it's where I would start again. Mm. But for him in the end, what actually made the difference was actually working with psychedelic medicine. Wow. And it was more of a mindset shift for him. Hmm. Um, and I think that there was a lot of trauma wrapped up in these injuries. There was a lot of feeling stuck, feeling unseen, unheard, unwitnessed, unloved. And that was participating in how blocked he felt with athletics. And so working with psychedelic medicines, which for him, we did in a structured setting, I wasn't facilitating it, but I'm mm. referring out to practitioners. Um, and he did that. It was indicated, wasn't contraindicated for him. So all of those caveats always apply, but for him, it was a mindset shift and he worked through some old traumas and he really started to see himself as inherently lovable. Um, he was able to work through old grievances. It was really actually shifting on that more psycho-spiritual level where he was stuck and held back that allowed him to access getting back into sports and not feeling victimized by injuries. Sure. Well done. What a great story. Interesting. Okay. So let's go now. I'd like to define some terms, which I think are very important because stress has been demonized the word. And we talk about distress and you stress, good stress, and then maybe put it in a frame of anxiety. I love the anatomy of anxiety, somatic anxiety, or possibly false anxiety, as you mm -hmm. call it, and then true anxiety. Let's give a bit of definition to these terms. Mm, I love that you brought up you stress and when stress is not an inherently bad thing. And I love mm. reframing people when they feel a sense of like, oh, I'm really jittery about this. But sometimes it's passion. Yeah. Sometimes it's excitement. Sometimes it's salience, like something important is happening right now. And we don't have to frame that as a negative thing. But for the purposes of my book, where I divide anxiety into these two types of anxiety, false anxiety, true anxiety, where false anxiety is avoidable anxiety, it's based in the physical body. True anxiety is purposeful anxiety. It's not something to pathologize, it's something to listen to. With that false anxiety, it is mediated largely by a stress response. But in that sense, I mean very specifically on a, on a granular level, when we are tipped into a state of imbalance and the response of the body is to secrete cortisol and adrenaline in somewhat of a pronounced spike. And so it's it's not just the sort of you stress or, or even a healthy cortisol spike upon waking in the morning, but more of an unpleasant state that we subjectively experience as anxiety or even panic. And so a big part of how I support my patient's mental health is by identifying the ways that our modern lives are unnecessarily tipping us into a stress response and how can we mitigate that, eliminate that, avoid it whenever it's unnecessary and then they're in fewer stress responses and they have less anxiety. Brilliant. So not to demonize stress, good stress, and then distress. And let's talk a little bit about vagal tone and just the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and the value that you place on heart rate variability. Yeah, I think heart rate variability is, is massively important. And 
And I think that it's sometimes a direct focus of treatment, like having somebody do something like heart math or do kind of resonance, like coherent breathing to make sure that they're directly accessing a state of greater heart rate variability. But sometimes it's more for me of a marker of, are we on track? Are we making progress? Mm. Um, Or, you know, it clues me into this person's body is really held in a state of unhealthy stress if their heart rate variability is low. So I think that what I'm often doing is just trying to cultivate more parasympathetic tone, more dorsal vagal tone. And that's really different for everybody. And sometimes I think of it as sort of the way I structure it in my mind is sometimes it's let's eliminate unnecessary sympathetic responses. So that's, you know, identifying causes of false anxiety. Are they on a blood sugar roller coaster? Are they sensitive to caffeine and consuming excessive amounts? Um, Is alcohol past a, you know, playing a role in this for somebody? Um, Overwork, screens in the evening, unhealthy circadian rhythm, Mm. hormone imbalance, inflammation, dietary intolerances, gut health issues, so on and so forth. So I'm always looking at causes of unnecessary sympathetic drive or stress. But then I'm also looking at where do we need to discharge the stress that we inevitably accumulate over the course of our lives. And some of that comes down to completing the stress cycle, thinking about the fact that when you look at an animal, if it's an animal of prey, they just had this acute stressful experience, they'll often shake afterward. Their body seems to have a process for Mm. discharging excess adrenaline and communicating to the nervous system that the threat has passed and it's now once again safe to be in Mm. their body. And so for many of my patients, I want them to have a daily practice for discharging the stress that we hold on to. And it can be shaking, it could be dancing, exercise, chanting, journaling, crying, cuddling. There's so many different good ways to do that. Um, I think there's a deeper version of that around trauma and unresolved trauma, where it's almost like the body at the level of the limbic system is stuck in a state of hyperarousal. The, the foot is stuck on the gas pedal. And then it's really reprogramming at the level of the limbic system to help the brain know that was then, this is now. And then the third branch of this is if we've prevented unnecessary stress responses, discharge the stress that's inevitable that we accumulate through our lives, can we also just spend some time cultivating a relaxation state? And that's where it can be anything from a cold shower or a cold water plunge to doing yoga nidra or a sort of non-sleep deep deep relaxation. Um, Meditation and breath work are wonderful practices here. So there's so many different ways to cultivate parasympathetic tone. And I think that the more time we can spend in that state, healing occurs there, creativity occurs there. It's a good thing to take almost like a daily multivitamin. Wow, that was well articulated and there's a lot there. So I want to go into possibly one or two in those three groups, but maybe define anxiety because I think it's really important for people that are listening. We are talking to Dr. Ellen Vora, a board certified psychiatrist. This is a real condition. It really does affect your system. So maybe elaborate on how important it is with regards to, you know, cell phones, laptops, Wi-Fi, being aware of sort of cellular radiation so that people can understand that it's affecting their mental health. Yeah. So um, with tech anxiety, I'll break this one into maybe four branches. (laughs) So the first one is the conversation that's already happening quite a lot. So I don't feel like I have anything new to add, but we know that social media prompts us to compare and despair. We feel FOMA, we feel left out. Never before have we been able to be so aware of when something's happening and we weren't invited or someone else has a life that looks aspirational to us and we only see the highlight reel and we don't see the reality behind that, that everyone has problems. Um, I think that there's even a, a slightly subtler aspect of that conversation, which is that social media with its character limits and the relative anonymity and lack of accountability means that it's just fertile ground for relational aggression. And so we, this, and the research shows us that women are even more prone to being upset and um, feeling down after any kind of exchange that involves relational aggression online. Hmm. So that's a piece of the conversation. The parts that I think are, we're not talking about enough. One is that 
we just have to appreciate. We are living in the attention economy, which is to say our attention is the commodity yeah. being competed for by very smart companies. And they know their behavioral psychology. They know their neuroscience. They know that if they prey on our fear response or instill uncertainty or doubt or controversy, we will rubberneck. We will hand over an increasingly large share of our attention. Mm. They get more eyeballs, more clicks, more ad revenue. They're the big winners, but yeah. it's our mental health that's the collateral damage. So I think that the onus is on us, unfortunately at this point, to navigate the informational landscape, eyes wide open, making very conscious, self-loving choices about who gets to tell us what and in what way and how often and at what time of day. And I think that this is going to impact our mental health across multiple dimensions. But I, I think of this as the banality of fear, which is that currently we're being bathed in fear because it helps companies do well. It helps advertising companies sell us products we don't need. It yeah. helps social media companies keep our eyeballs glued to them. And it's it's not a deep, nefarious reason always. It's just that people are trying to make money yeah. and the formula is using fear. And so we end up being bathed in it and we're stressed and anxious as a result. The sure. last little branch that's an aspect of tech anxiety that I think we're not talking enough about is actually just the body postures that happen as we engage with technology. And, you know, humans didn't used to have a need to always be in this position. Yeah. And it, I, I really think about how on a very just mechanical level, we can't breathe as deeply. Our, our, the mechanics of our lungs don't operate as well when we're hunched over. Um, but I think on a more esoteric level about the flow of whether you want to call it blood flow, cerebral spinal fluid, or even chi or prana, I think it's cutting off the smooth flow of energy around our bodies. So I think our brains aren't functioning as well. It's contributing to our facial structure. We're, we're mouth breathing mm. and not nose breathing. Yeah. We're not sleeping as well. Our cognition is impacted negatively. So there's just so many ways that the postures involved in this tighten us and contract us and contribute to poor health on a very mechanical level. Well said. And in that last group, what's very important is a condition called cervical vagopathy and the change in the cervical spine and the pressure on the vagus nerve that's been measured. I'll link you with one of my mentors, Dr. Hauser. He's done a lot of work on the cervical spine and what happens to the vagus nerve, what happens to a brain blood flow and how important that is and the treatments he does into the neck. And a lot of it is this position here that puts a significant strain on the vagus nerve. So I totally agree. I think the posture and the neuromuscular skeletal system is really linked to the vagal tone. Good. So let's talk about anxiety. I got really excited about CGM a long time ago. People like were wide-eyed that I was using it with non-diabetics and thought, what is this freak doing? But I thought it was so important to my patients. I still have a huge barrier here. Medical insurance companies do not pay for CGMs for people that are not diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. But how important is anxiety? What is it? And just your view and on CGM. Yeah, I think that I love that this is now finally becoming more of a mainstream conversation. I'm mm. sure you're feeling very vindicated after mm. however many years of swimming upstream and convincing people to get involved with CGMs. Blood sugar is so vital. And this has to do with the fact that for a very long portion of human evolution, having enough to eat was a matter of life or death. And we just have such different availability of what and how much and, and what, what food is available and when and in what ways. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the conditions under which we evolved. And I think that with our processed foods engineered to be hyper palatable, and, you know, so often it always tends towards things that tend to spike our blood sugar. Many of us are walking around quite dysglycemic and symptomatic as a result in ways that we didn't know to attribute. Most people think blood sugar is just a matter of diabetes. And then even within that, they think diabetes is diabetes. That's, that's the last stop. It gives you diabetes. And maybe that leads to retinopathy or, or other issues, but we need to recognize it's not narrow, it's incredibly broad. And dysglycemia and the consequences in our bodies relates to dementia and mental health and cardiovascular health and longevity and 
you know, I, I heard you had Joel Salatin on, on your podcast at one point. Love him. Yeah, yeah. And he, in Omnivore's Dilemma, he introduced an idea that I think about all the time. I, If I'm not getting it wrong, I hope. He said, you know, people think, oh, you're a farmer. Do you raise cattle? Do you raise goats? Are you raising chickens? He's like, no, we're grass farmers. Everyone, yeah. maybe it's soil, grass. It's yeah. basically everyone's a grass farmer. Yeah, that's that's right. the lifeblood of the yeah. farm. And I think as human beings, we are all vasculature farmers. Mm. Our vasculature, the functioning of our vasculature is the lifeblood of every other organ system working properly. And when we're dysglycemic and our blood sugar is spiking and the oxidative and inflammatory impact that that has, we're damaging our microvasculature, which in, in ways that are apparent can impact the health of our eyes, the health of our calves. But in ways that are subtler, it's chronically over time impacting our brain health, our heart health. Um, every, our kidney health, we're, we're not vital when our vasculature is damaged, which it is by our modern food environment of refined carbohydrates and added sugars and inflammatory foods. So CGMs, I love because sometimes we need a little bit of an objective instrument to be like, it's really happening. <laughs> and then yeah. it gives people the ability to do real-time science for themselves. I want to eat my oatmeal for breakfast, but now I'm seeing it spikes my blood sugar. But if I add a little bit of nut butter and it doesn't spike it quite yeah. as much, or if I start with eggs and bacon, then I'm really home free. Yeah. And just for people to have that real time feedback can really influence their behavior and their choices. Mm. Um, so I think it's everything and it's mm. underappreciated in mental health with anxiety. When our blood sugar spikes, as it does in our modern diet, because it's all refined carbohydrates and coffee drinks that are secretly milkshakes and rose all day, our blood sugar is on a roller coaster, and every time it crashes, we have a stress response. That's how the body cues the liver to break down the storage of starch that it maintains, the glycogen stores. And it also creates urgency to forage for food. And so we're in these unnecessary stress responses, which feel synonymous with anxiety or even panic. And it's just coming from our blood sugar roller coaster ride. So if we can maintain stable blood sugar, this can stave off a lot of unnecessary anxiety. Sure. So would you say that person listening out there who struggled with anxiety, who struggled with depression or burnout should get us one of the big sort of markers or biohacking tools or devices is a CGM? It depends on the person. I think in general, yes. I am always here to support someone who's who just wants to listen to their body. You know, and I have a lot of patients who we got into this work before CGMs were even all yeah. that available. And so they just started to learn, oh, this is what it feels like when I'm in a blood sugar crash. And they've done that self-experimentation in a more analog way. But I think if CGM is accessible to someone, it's a wonderful tool. And it's not only going to improve your physical health, but also your mental health. Good. We have discussed sleep significantly on the show, but I do want your take on middle sleep. Just talking about circadian biology, I think from a psychiatrist, and there are many doctors out there that talk about circadian biology, you know, session pan of the circadian code and that. But when it comes from a psychiatrist, when it comes from someone who's seen a lot of patients over the years, it seems to impact people that are struggling with mental health in a far greater way. So maybe take us through a little bit of your roadmap with regards to circadian biology and sleep. Yeah. So I, I'll try not to be redundant with what other amazing <laughs> podcast guests you've had. They've covered a lot of this ground. Yeah. I would say from a mental health standpoint, the first important thing to embrace is that we have a cultural narrative around the fact that our mental health issues impact our sleep. And I won't deny that, but it's a bi-directional relationship. And we're so focused on, I'm not sleeping well. It's my depression. It's the anxiety. And that's actually the less helpful direction of flow of that traffic. What's also true, what we know with very robust evidence basis is that better sleep improves every single mental health condition under the sun. And that's the easier entry point. Seven years of psychotherapy on the couch to fix the depression or a week of optimizing your circadian yeah. rhythm, you're sleeping better, you're less depressed. I prefer to start there. Um, I think that Circadian rhythm wise, I just try to simplify that conversation for people. There's a lot that you can talk about with that meal timing, exercise timing, chronotypes, you can get into it. But if, we, if I ask nothing else from people, it's these two things. When you do wake up, ideally early, ideally consistently, but life happens, 
you just make sure you actually get sunshine into your eyeballs as early as possible, not through a car windshield, not through blue blocking glasses or sunglasses or the blue blocking lens on our regular glasses, but real sunshine into our actual eyeballs directly. And that starts the clock. But then in the evening, I love for people to power down electronics, to wear blue blocking glasses, to live by candlelight, to throw their phone in the ocean and homestead and raise chickens and entirely move off the grid. Like these are great ways to protect our circadian rhythm. But short of that, even just becoming aware of our tired signs and knowing to get ourselves to bed in that window, that sweet spot when we're perfectly tired. I learned this when I had my daughter and I, as with a baby, it's very overt. They're tired at a certain point and then they're overtired. And I realized we as adults, just oversized toddlers in so many ways, we also have a sweet spot. It's give or take around three hours after sunset. It'll vary a little bit by chronotype and how much mm. sleep we need, but that's a good pro tip and sort of range to look for it. And when you notice your tired signs, yawning, falling asleep on the couch, rubbing your eyes, that's a really good time to swoop yourself to bed and you'll fall asleep more easily, stay asleep through the night. Middle sleep is something that I'm in transition about how I'm working with this with my patients. We've all kind of come across that data that maybe human sleep is biphasic. Maybe there are two symmetric blocks of sleep. Maybe, maybe not. It's conflicting research right now. But I, what I do find is true is that for people that wake up every night around halfway through their sleep, so if they go to sleep at 10 and they need eight hours of sleep and they wake up at 2 a.m., I think it's critically important for them to just have something to latch onto, to reassure themselves. This is a normal physiologic wake up. This is middle sleep. And so instead of telling ourselves that story of, oh no, I'm up in the middle of the night. I'm going to be up all night. Tomorrow will be a bad day to instead say, this is middle sleep. I'm going to do the squinty shuffle to the bathroom, not let my eyes see light to disrupt that would suppress our melatonin, have a sip of water, lie back down and reassure ourselves that this is okay. And we will naturally fall back asleep because that stressful story of I'll be up all night becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sure. Great. We both got daughters. I've got a little six-year-old daughter. I love her to bits. Uh, I've got an eight-year-old and we waited 10 years, uh, had a like, long fertility journey, but we had our little miracle child. I'd like to, and this is parents for parents, you know, looking at firstly sleep, how important that is for conditions like ADHD that just seem to be so pervasive and extremely pernicious in the society. I've never seen it before. 24 years of practice, I just cannot understand what's happened to children needing occupational therapy and physical therapy and speech therapy and integration and remedial therapy. And there is a place for that, but it just seems to have exponentially increased. So talk about sleep firstly, and I'm going to ask a double question here because I think it's important. But in terms of the self-talk of a young lady growing up it's like almost a blank slate i see my daughter as a sponge and so i'm trying to give her a narrative and a story that she believes for herself that becomes her own so that she can just develop a very strong self-worth and self-esteem because if she doesn't she seems to be affected by a lot of different voices in her life so maybe just comment on those two with regards to a young lady or daughter growing up in this very crazy world it's a beautiful question. I'll caveat this by saying, yeah, I'm an adult psychiatrist and none of this is my professional training. This is just me as a mother of a seven-year-old daughter um, and trying to help her navigate this wild world. Um, you know, I think you, you kind of came into this with a lens around sleep and a big part of what I do is not that psycho-spiritual, it's physiologic. Mm. And I'm really just trying to give her the physical foundation for well-being because that is a central thesis of how I approach mental health is that if we get our physiology right, we're a lot more resilient in the face of the challenges that are inevitable in our lives. So keeping her blood sugar stable, keeping nutrient dense foods in her diet, less inflammatory foods in her diet within reason, which isn't always easy. Mm. Um, early bedtime, a dark, cold room, white noise machine, um, minimizing screens as much as possible always keeping that in balance and not creating the conditions for this to backfire or for a yeah. rebellion down the road. It's a, it's a dance. <laughs> um, but in terms of that self-worth and self-love, 
I, I guess the way I approach this is, is a couple of things. One is I try to model it. And I think about the messaging that we just unwittingly do when we say like, "Ugh, I don't like how I look in these clothes or no, I don't want to be in the picture or uh, I should really eat more broccoli. Like all the things that we say, that's basically like, I'm not worthy and mm. I should be healthy implying I don't want to. Um, I think that that messaging is really important. So I, I live this, but basically I'm inherently worthy. I'm, I'm out here as a flawed human doing my best like anyone else mm. and that's good enough. So a lot of healthy self-talk that I do for myself, but modeling that for her. I think that I love the work of Dr. Becky Kennedy and her book, Good Inside. And I think it's so important that we want to be a really good source of validation and open, non-stressful, non-judgmental communication where we catch our children's bids. Because I think if we do that when they're young, that's our best shot at maintaining those open lines of communication as they get older. And so it's really just not defaulting into all the self-absorbed and emotion phobic programming that we have as a culture where someone says, wow, I'm sad because like this girl was mean to me. We want to make our children feel more comfortable. So we say things like, oh, you know, she's wrong to not like you or you'll be fine or you'll have friends eventually, mm -hmm. whatever it is um, to dismiss in that way is so unnerving to a child because to them this is the realest thing mm. they don't know that if they don't have a friend when they're six it turns out they'll be fine when they're 36 this is the dress rehearsal for relationships throughout the rest of their lives it is important it is their yeah. job right now so to validate that and be like yeah i can understand how that feels really hard i often will tell stories from when i was younger and when i struggled with relationships my daughter's eyes bug out really you did and just to know she's not alone in that. Mm. Um, and so I think just really validating communication and to never miss a bid because they come at us with things that seem silly. And we're like, yeah. uh, and sometimes we have to be like, uh. <laughs> but yeah. if we dismiss it now, they're not going to want to come to us when the things are serious. Brilliant. Well said. I think that's very profound. We're coming to the end of the show. Uh, give us some of your feedback on some incredible techniques that I found beneficial, but I'd like to get your perspective on emotional freedom techniques like EFT, EMDR, possibly things like singing or humming, acupuncture, infrared sauna. We have recently found a device called the Flex Beam that does red light therapy that's portable that you can place on the abdomen place it on, a, you know, especially a child's back and help with just the vagus nerve, settles them down. I think we read light deficient, malillumination, I think is really important. So I'm just throwing some out there. I think cold therapy for a lot of my patients that have struggled with anxiety and the adrenaline release that's comfort hasn't been helpful for them. That's just my perspective. I've gone rather for infrared sauna or something gentle. So give us your perspective because you've got a very you know long history and experience as a psychiatrist. I love everything you mentioned, except I've never heard of flex beam before, but I agree that we're malilluminated. I think yeah. it's a concept I learned on your podcast. I think it's brilliant. Um, basically, sometimes these are overwhelming to my patients and I'll, I'll take the cue from them and really run it back to the fundamentals. Do we need to be high tech, fancy and involved with our wellness? I think in general, the foundational things like, are we getting good quality sleep? Are we feeding ourselves real food, nourishing foods from an attitude of self-love? Are we moving our bodies, connecting to nature, connecting to community, have a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives? That's the real bedrock of well-being. Mm. Um, and, and I think that if someone's like, okay, I really just need something to try, or I need, I'm on a therapeutic phase of this journey and I need to see a quicker win, then I get these other techniques involved. And I love them all. I love for patients to have a portable infrared sauna in their home. Like if someone can invest and get a real one, great. But mm. I have the little pop-up tents and mm. it gets the job done. And I think something like that, just a, a regular wellness practice that helps with detoxification, has a hormesis effect, can certainly support patients if they're tapering off of psych meds or um working through parasite protocol or a heavy metal mm. protocol, this can be helpful in all these ways. 
um, acupuncture. I'm an acupuncturist. I, to me, I, that's a particular predilection, but I love it for so many reasons. And if nothing else, the way it induces deep relaxation is therapeutic. Um, and um, EFT is really nice just because it's free and you can do it at home yeah. for yourself. And that's yeah. so empowering and so self-loving. Um, and then there was maybe remind me of any of the others that I missed. EMDR or yeah. EMDR and, and sort of cousins with EMDR, which is, um, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, I believe, yeah. reprogramming. Yeah. Um, and then DNRS or dynamic neural retraining system, and then somatic experiencing therapy. To me, these are my go-to trauma focused therapies. Okay. If someone's limbic system is stuck in the on position from an old unresolved trauma, I usually think, we need to go straight to one of these trauma focused therapies and just get that into a different place. Let their limbic system start to understand that was then this is now, and just be able to take the foot off the accelerator pedal ever so slightly. Um, and so I always go to that. And, and importantly, I don't think talk therapy is necessarily the appropriate setting for working through trauma. It's not as effective as these limbic level programs, but also it can be re-traumatizing it can just hash and rehash the details. Mm. So operating on the level of the nervous system and the limbic system, I think is more effective. Brilliant. Well, you are a shining light for people listening. I have a person that I desperately want to meet one day. I just declare favor and blessing over you. You are just an incredible human being. Your essence is just beautiful to see people's lives transformed. Uh, I do this show and I may, I do it because I get people like you to share their life's work and calling. And so we'll put all your social media channels um, in the show notes, but give us one last message of hope for people listening out there. You know, mental ill health is exponentially increasing. I've just worked with corporates, many of them, many of the teams that we've worked with, we've done a lot of functional medicine with them and biohacking have needed to take extended leave that's over three months in the last year because of burnout. So give us a message of hope that people can hold on to. Yeah. So, and Steve, I also just want to reflect back that you're so clearly doing this work from a, such a place of pure integrity and love. And, and it's beautiful. I love having kindred spirits in this space, mm. compulsively wanting to shift consciousness and help yeah. people feel well. I would say a final pearl or takeaway is probably something I should have said early on, which is a very fundamental paradigm shift around how we understand mental health. And we have all been indoctrinated with the idea that our mental health is the result of a genetic chemical imbalance. It's our serotonin, it's yeah. our destiny, and we're yeah. stuck. And it's simply not true. And that has led to a very limited menu of offerings of how we support people. We say it's meds or it's therapy. And if that works for you, great. I count that as a victory, but I also know that there are millions of people for whom that hasn't brought satisfactory relief. And I want those folks to know, do not despair. There's always reason for hope. Our mental health is determined by so much more than our genes. Genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger and our sleep and our nutrition and our inflammation levels and hormones and digestive health and movement and connection to nature and meaning and purpose and community and service, all of this also dramatically influences our mental health. It's so much more under our control than we realize. And I mean that to be a message of hope and empowerment so that we know that this mountain of healing actually doesn't just have the path of therapy and the path of medication. There are infinite paths up this mountain and there's always something for anybody struggling. Sure. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and calling. And we're going to try and advance your work and your book as best as we can in Africa and beyond. Oh, Steve, thank you so much. Thank you.